Hello everyone. Today we will discuss another unique topic, BGP plus SPF. So uh, if you think about BGP, probably you know BGP. At some level, you probably also know SPF, but this is not the link state protocol discussion. This is not the BGP discussion as well. We are bringing them together. Uh, there is a new IETF group, uh, link state vector routing, LSVR. And basically in this group, uh, the protocol BGP plus SPF, we are replacing BGP's best best selection algorithm with the SPF. Why we are doing this? What is the reason? Uh, main target is data center routing. Maybe the other places we will see as well. We will discuss those. And as you might know, in the data center routing space, already we have an RFC 7938 and Rift uh, soon will become an RFC as well, routing in Fetris. In the, uh, our YouTube channel, you can find videos about Rift. Uh, Tony P was there, Jeff Tanstra was there. Also, you can find 7938 PGP uh, RFC. And uh, now we will discuss another uh, new topic. So with me, Jeff Tanstra uh, and Kayur. Uh, please, Kayur, you are new uh, for us. Uh, please introduce yourself for the audience who may not know you. And let's start after that. Good morning and thank you for having me, guys. My name is Kayur Patel. I am uh, one of the founders and CTO at Arcus. Um, and uh, just for our audience to give a little introduction upfront of Arcus, um, we are a networking systems startup that focuses on building um, networking solutions, be it router switches or uh, cloud-based uh, 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 internet gateways uh, based on open networking um, concepts, and that's what we do at Arcus. So, uh, if I understand correctly, are you building uh, software for the routers, switches, etc., or am I wrong? What exactly so, Arcus is doing? I sure. Understand. So, in the open networking world, what typically happens is that if you open up a switch or a router, um, Let's talk about the simple case where you have a fixed form factor switch or a router. A fixed form factor switch router has an ASIC chip that is a switching chip or a routing chip. Um, then you have a uh, processor that typically comes from Intel or an ARM. You have a bunch of peripherals um, that sort of translates uh, into fan, temperature control, any kind of SFPs. They come together and then they make a hardware component box. On top of it, if you look at operating systems, you sort of break it down into four high-level slices. You have kernel, and you may make use of kernel for process and memory management. Um, you, you may use the kernel for IP TCP stack. So that's one aspect of the software. Then there's a second aspect of the software where you collect all the device drivers that are needed to run on the box for the fan, temperature control, all sorts of things that are there. Um, which are accessories to the switching or a routing chip. And all those device drivers um, come together and build another software. In old world, we used to call this as a platform-dependent software. That's another part. The third part is the SDK that drives the chip, wherein you program the routes or ACLs or cores or whatever you may have that you need to program it on a switching or a routing chip. And the fourth part is the control plane. When you combine these four things together, it magically becomes an operating system. And it could be for fixed form factor operating systems or for a chassis based operating systems. So we write networking system software that magically converts a bare metal uh, box into a switch or a router depending on the chipset that it has. Mm -hmm. Does that give a good overview? No, yeah, exactly now. I got the point. In more, more common terminology, it's combination of not. So networking operation system plus routing stack and task. Fully vertically integrated. So uh, normally, I think it's okay we are uh, together now. I think uh, Cumulus is doing the, almost the same thing, so, right? It's similar. Yes. Similar, similar thing. Okay. Uh, by the way, Jeff Tanstra uh, with us. So Jeff, for those maybe who don't know you, still if there is anyone, our uh, followers, please hey, can into this, yeah. So you Thanks are... for being here. So, <laughs> most of you know me, uh, Jeff. I'm with Astra, uh, building intent-based networking. 
So something that could govern something like key or software. Uh, I've known Kiyur for probably 20 years. Uh, Kiyur didn't tell you, but he spent half his life at Cisco as distingu distinguished engineer in BGP. So if you run Cisco BGP, most chances it's written by Kiyur. He is one of the most productive engineers ever in yeah. terms of quality, amount of code written, and I want to bug, but. <laughs> by the way, by the way, those uh, who don't know these guys, these guys are very active in the ETF and uh, both are producing a lot of documents. Uh, many old RFCs you are uh, reading probably uh, went through these guys. So, or and uh, as Jeff said, uh, lots of the codes if you are using uh, Cisco boxes, uh, KU okay. was involved. So uh, I am lucky to have both of them uh, with me, and we will have an excellent discussion. So let's start. Link state vector routing, LSVR. Why we have this? What LSVR is doing? Cool. Um, so um, let's talk about what the lay of the landscape is in the modern data centers. If you look at all modern data centers that are out there today, and I'd like to break the data centers out into three categories. Uh, particularly from operator standpoint, the operators who are growing the data centers um, for about uh, under, I want to say, 250 switches a year, which means set of operators who buy up to 250 switches, whether it be the leaf spine um, or uh, in the management switch. Then you have operators who buy from 250 to uh, 2,000 to 3,000 switches a year because they have medium-sized data centers um, or you could say somewhat larger size. And then you have MSDCs who buy from 3,000 to 16, 20, 25,000 switches a year, massively scaled data centers, right? You see all these different types of data centers, they are IP clause, leaf spine based. Um, they, most of them have deployed um, layer three as a fabric, or if they have done layer two based, are transitioning towards layer three. And when they do layer three, they typically deploy BGP as a routing protocol. So uh, the reason to do that for them is scale, um, simplicity, um, that they want to um, uh, go and attack, um, and they want to build resiliency inside that. You have ECMPs for the reason, because you want it to be resilient, right? And if you look at where they are going to go from where they are to the next level, you are going to see that um, the spines are going to be more and more denser, which means you're going to see them as a factory clause of, or a folded clause, if you will, um, where the spine layer is putting more and more port densities, um, and the port speeds are growing as well. Um, you're going to see more and more layers as the growth happens inside the data center. It's inevitable. So and then you're going to see an of the new applications yes basically what we are saying uh, maybe not three stage but five stage maybe more uh, stage close topologies we are saying. okay that is very good yes absolutely now as they grow and as the spines uh, where the chipsets are becoming a lot more powerful in sense that they can host more ports the fan out is growing to grow now, if you look at the existing data centers, like we said, um, they have multiple tiers. They typically have deployed hop by hop protocol, which is BGP. And BGP announces a set of routes from Tor to Leaf, Leaf to Spine. Um, every time the best path is computed, the routes go further. Once the path is computed and the best path is selected, and you propagate the route. You try and keep the route. Just interrupt you for a second. So it's an interesting topic. We see switches coming up with 400 gig and soon 800 gig interfaces. Yeah. However, what we also can prove mathematically that wider fan out is more important than faster link. So you see a very large data center such as Facebook who went to new architecture like X16 where you go from fatter links and less ports to more ports and more distributed links to use ECMP that provides better resiliency, that provides faster and better distribution of traffic across public. So while switch is becoming faster, we'll definitely see wider and wider fun outs. It just makes sense from network architecture perspective, 
from traffic receivers. So basically, from the point. from the leaf switches to the spine switches, we are seeing more ECMP ways, more connections, basically. Yeah, that's a brilliant point that Jeff made. If you look at uh, um, uh, Broadcom's um, uh, uh, Tomahawk 3 uh, chip, it provides you 32 ports of 400 gigs. But while it provides you 32 ports of 400 gigs, to Jeff's point, it can also do high density 128 ports of 100 gigs. And therein you just see an explosion um, as, as now it can provide 128 port um, typically at the lower layer, that would be the pan out that would just extend upon and, and close to prove Jeff's point, yeah? yeah? So as you look at that, what happens is that BGP peering now starts to scale um, with regards to the pan out that you have. And the natural growth in those ports and port densities has a direct correlation to the peering model that has been deployed today. Now, the reason why that peering model has been deployed today is because it's hop by hop peer. Traditional ISPs have solved this problem by putting route reflectors in middle. But the traditional ISPs also run IGPs underneath it to calculate the graph. And while uh, data center folks want to have nimble, really simple, really sleek operating systems for obvious reasons, including stability, because when you're deploying at the scale, one thing you want, um, aside from convergence and faster scale, is stability in the OS, and therefore have less protocols to be deployed. You now have to figure out how do you do IGP-like operations within BGP if you start to decouple the peering model from the fan outs that you're going to see. Okay, one question. One question, uh, yes. what I understand is, peering model here, you, uh, it seems different, right? Hop by hop, we are saying. Uh, so basically, we don't have a uh, route reflector because most of these guys, I think we assume they are deploying EBGP, not IBGP. EBGP. And then Correct. what we have is basically based on maybe uh, that in information RFC 7938, uh, what we are deploying, uh, not even maybe loop back to loop back, as I know, but directly uh, direct interface addressing we are using to have the BGP neighborship, so we don't need to have any underlay IGP, etc. for the communication. Okay. Correct. And you want to still preserve this, the requirement of not having the underlay IGP. At the same time, you want to scale BGP and you want to solve the peering problem of the BGP um, by not having them bounded to interface. You have BFD who can give you a much better um, uh, reactive time. And at the same time, you want to deploy BGP for the fact that BGP is used for, which is routing protocol and fast conversions. And if you were to go down that path, you have to do certain changes to BGP, and that is why LSVR. Okay. So, by the way, BFT for link level liveness, right? So, face failure detection, we are, uh, in general, we are using. But most of the data centers, we have, what, point-to-point -point co connections. So, there is not any transport equipment in between. There is no equipment which can prevent loss of signal to be propagated. So, in which case then, uh, in those data centers, BFT we are using for liveness detection? What's the case? Yeah, we touched upon this topic uh, with Jeff Doyle uh, during uh, fast conversion BGP data center. Uh, what's important here, however, is while you can still rely on lots of signal, lots of light on point-to-point -point linking data center, quite often your port might stay up, your IP stuff might get screwed, right? So, you still see port up, but you cannot pass IP traffic. And this is where BFD helps. Number two, on all modern chipsets, BFD is implemented as silicon function. It's no comfortable function anymore. So you can much faster by registering other protocols, in this case BGP, with BFD state, your convergence is faster than relying on pure link down and propagation into replicant. So BFD is still very much recommended to be used for it. Okay.
Yeah, and 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 that that's why if you start to go back to the principles that um, the architectural tenets that most operators use in data centers is that hey, we want a nimble stack. We want hardware to do the job that hardware is doing, which is what Jeff um, uh, articulated it very well, which is forwarding of the data packets and implement liveness in there. Then you want one protocol. And if you want one protocol, how do you scale that protocol out in data centers as the clock starts to scale? Or gets wider and deeper. And how do you make sure um, you get what you want, including the traffic engineering, fast routing, fast convergence, scale in place through a nimble software stack. By the way, right. Kior, maybe yeah. it is it is a interesting question. Uh, there is a question coming, and it, it might be interesting. Both of you, we, we could have an idea. Okay, EBGP, these guys are deploying, but uh, sure, we don't have route reflector. What about route server? Route server also control plane function. Could it be so possible a uh, route server in 7938 uh, design? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And so when we use in this um, conversation the word route reflector uh, for our audience, we will, we will assume that we are using the terminology interchangeably between route reflector for IBGP and route controller for EBGP. So that you you know you can draw a parallelism about the same functionality within BGP to be executed whether you are doing E or I BGP conversation. But your your point is bang on. An interesting point here. So traditionally, when we use route servers in uh, Internet Exchange environment, it requires very particular functionality such as running calculation per peer, such yes. as not depending your own IS because then you will attract traffic, right? In data center, it doesn't really matter. What you could do in data center is still having your route server to use their own ISN. Still, since all endpoints are equidistant, doesn't change anything. But as you go from three stage to five stage, using daisy chain propagation makes less and less sense. So having two or four route servers that are beefy, have good BGP stack and distribute routes across all people who are interested in receiving them, makes architecture much more scalable. So but what I understand is maybe in the yeah three stage flow, if you put a uh, route server, it's same as uh, doing hop by hop routing, uh, but when the number of stage grows, so it makes sense to reduce the number of uh, BGP session and operation, right? Okay. Yeah, so let, let's decouple the discussions about underlay. And here we would like still to have pay sharing between liability and routing propagation. In overlay, however, it makes absolutely no sense. So in a lot of implementations, you will see lead sending uh, EVP and route to spine, for example. This makes no sense and requires your spine to do things spine shouldn't. If you use router server, instead, you could have all lead peering to route server and spine super spine super super spine do exactly what they're supposed to be doing, fast forward track. And one thing we should also keep in mind to Jeff's point is in this conversation, when we talk about route servers or route reflectors, we use it interchangeably and not assume also, which Jeff was hinting there, with of where its location be. You could have a virtual one sitting um, on the management plane, or you could have inline uh, route server or route controller, or you can have it um, sitting at the top of a tier and all those placements are possible. So the whole idea about going back to why LSVR is to give a solution that allows flexibility to operators to deploy the way they want in their network, the notion of route server, route controller, or um, maybe route reflector if they're using IBGP sessions in the clause, which I'm not seeing yet, but it's possible, yeah? Okay. Right? So. Uh, so that is what we have today. Now, if you look at IGP semantics, there are certain certain good things about IGP, and that is that SPF is very very fast. You flood, and you announce. Uh, you, you announce, and everybody computes uh, with the same set of data, and SP using SPF algorithm. So there is no reliance over one node against another. 
that's the most powerful aspect of uh, in a GP protocols that uses the extra or, uh, uh, or a graph based mechanism has a much more faster convergence as well. The downside of IGPs, as we all know, and um, you articulated right at the beginning of the session, uh, is that it has flooding uh, problems. And there is somewhat complexity in actually coming up with this algorithm. To look at BGP, and if we are looking to do the modification, and if we take a step back and say, what's good about BGP, where well, it's simple you know how to troubleshoot. Most of the data centers have designed their operational, um, entire operational mechanism around BGP. They understand it well, they can automate it, they can figure out how to get the routes, they can figure out how to understand neighbor down upstate, pull the data, do some kind of traffic engineering. They have a very good understanding of that. So it's operationally um, completely uh, automated and the cost involved to um, onboard BGP in the data center has already been taken care of. There is no additional cost there now. So if you do anything on top of BGP, you get that big benefit that a data center operator doesn't go like, oh, but now I need my entire operations engine to be revectorated. It's incremental here. And, and that's one of the reasons why BGP becomes very attractive in data center, land, van, um, any sort of deployments you talk about. It has certain nice semantics, which says incremental update announcement, reliable transport, because it runs on TCP. It can do uh, unequal cost multipaths very effectively. The downside is, well, it's not as fast as IGPs. It certainly cannot build a graph for you. In order for you to build a graph, it has to be either hop by hop, or it needs an IGP underneath it. And some might say, if that um, spine fan out grows from 3200 gigs to 12800 gigs, any more neighbor configurations to apply at each spine. And therefore, the configuration explosion also grows. Okay. And you have to be very careful. Okay. A right? couple of points so far. So uh, yes. you said for the topology information, I think you need to have that polluting information. So link state protocol, IGP. But you said also hope by hope routing. And here with, with the BGP in data center, we are doing hope by hope routing. Correct. But if you, that means that in BGP based data centers, because it can't do topology, you are naturally restricted to hop by hop routing only. Even if what Jeff said, uh, which was very interesting that you do E, VPNs end-to-end -end peering, if you want to do from door to door, you still need to run underlay BGP hop by hop to resolve that next hop. Okay. Another right. question. Another yeah. question. Uh, because this is yes. very uh, important because uh, I think you are the best person to uh, talk about it. Many times I've seen from the code complexity point of view, BGP is very clean and yeah, OSPF, ISAS, especially OSPF, from the code complexity point of view, you know, it's very complex. Why? I mean, maybe not everyone is, of course, a programmer. Uh, they may not know, but can you at least say something that we can understand why code is complex with the IGP OSPF, but BGP is much more cleaner? I heard this many times. Is so, it true? If it's true, why? So, if you look at BGP protocol and you open the protocol up, there is packet processing on an inbound side. Then there is an algorithm that has fixed set of steps that you executed. And then there is packet processing on outbound side. And of course, processing to install the routes. These functions are complex. These functions are not simple, but these functions are relatively less complex as opposed to computing just a Dijkstra and figuring it out that you need to do a flooding, figuring it out that there is no incremental update announcements. We could do inside PGP simple things like I announce a route to you and I know that the route has gone to you. I don't have to worry about it. Once I write it on a TCP socket because it's a stream socket, TCP guarantees additional complexity 
underneath it to make sure the packet reaches to you. I don't have that in uh, in, in IGP-based protocol. So I have to do periodic refresh. I have to build that machinery. So there is inherent amount of complexity that is involved um, in doing some of this functionality, and that is non-trivial. Yeah. Excellent explanation, by the way. Uh, so because... Plus fragmentation in ASIS and the state machine are really, really complex compared to BGP, where it's really straightforward. Okay. That's very correct. And, so, and one, then, one more thing, actually, before we move on, because from the configuration point of view, uh, always we used to say, because uh, per neighbor, you need to mention, okay, remote AS is this number, etc. Manual operation configuration might be complex. But now, this dynamic template-based configuration came out, and we are seeing it on the DMVPN type of uh, deployment when BGP is used, etc. Do you think this one is can be considered to reduce the uh, configuration complexity? Most definitely. You could use that. I think the most complex part of the BGP comes from, um, I, I think, the front end, which is that it's very policy rich and configuration rich. So if you do dynamic templates, you can pretty much solve some of these problems. However, it still will result into something where uh, you will have the neighbor sessions um, still grow from 32 neighbors to 128. So you're not going to solve peer scaling, you're going to solve the configuration aspect of it, which is a big way, don't get me wrong. Then you have still a peer scaling to worry about and a convergence, because as the fan out increases, you get more routes, you get more routes, you get more ECMPs, and now you have to worry about the convergence part, right? So. It does fall, but those are the pros and cons. What we said was, hey, look, if we have to solve this problem, and if we need to stay within the realms of BGP and solve it, we could design a new protocol, we could modify ISIS OSPF, or we could do it with BGP. And, and for LSVR, we stayed with BGP was because operations side of the world already understood and has incurred the cost. So we didn't want it to put more cost on top of it. We wanted it to go seamlessly in the existing networks with a software upgrade. And if you have that approach, then how about take the negative aspects of the IGP out, the minus points that I'm showing here, red points, and the negative aspects of BGP out and somehow come to something which becomes uh, very uh, hybrid. Yes. You take the distance vector algorithm functionality out. You keep all the TCP semantics and peering models as you want intact, but just take the distance vector functionality, the best part out, and actually replace it with a dextra. And if you replace it with Dijkstra, conceptually, you get what you want. Because now you have an ability to shunt the peering models and take that inline peering that you had out. You can still keep it in line if you want, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But now you can have a route reflector, route controller-like topologies, and it will still compute because you are running SPF. Should you decide to keep and co-locate that route reflector on a spine, it will still be very interesting because one of the side effects of Dijkstra, which we had in BGP was, you receive a route, you run a best part, you announce, install a route in the rib or fab, and then you announce, because it's a distance vector. You always announce what you think is the best. In link state, you don't need to hold on to that route. You receive it, you announce it. Then you run Dijkstra, and all the nodes run Dijkstra independently coming to the same conclusion. Okay. So now the side on the spines is, you get the route, you simply blast it to all the tors and spines up and down, and all of them run Dijkstra independently and get to what they want. The question is what you announce now. 
Yeah, because now what comes to my mind, uh, if you are announcing all the available pets, not just the best pet, would you run uh, somehow BGP pet hunting issue? Because you are announcing everything. It gets very simplified because now you run Dijkstra, everybody has the same uh, topology um, view, uh, yeah. map, everybody calculates it, and the path hunting gets diminished uh, yeah. pretty much. The reason for path hunting is, as you know, when I start to announce a withdrawal, the best path I choose, I have no idea. It's just a matter of time I'm going to withdraw that too. Yeah. Race condition problem. But now, there is no race condition here. Best. The best and the best. There is no race condition problem here because I already received everything. So I am deciding what is best now. I got all everything. I don't have to rely what neighbor is telling me and what he will tell me after a failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, when we did this, we looked at ISIS OSPF and we said, if you do this on a TCP, the biggest benefit is incremental updates. No flooding. If you have a route reflector-like concept or a route controller-like concept or a route uh, server-like concept, there is actually no flooding problem because the flooding problem is uh, localized to those points. They simply get the updates from the client and simply reflect it to the other clients. By the way, even if we put with the BGP plus SPA with the LSVR, uh, those controllers, they are not announcing only best pet. Even when we have those, they are announcing everything, all the available pets. Correct. Okay. Correct. And more interestingly, if those controllers are off path, not in the forwarding path, you don't even have to run any kind of SPF. You simply take yeah. it, announce it, yeah. and nip the SPF as part of the policy configuration and let the clause tore leaf spine simply run SPF and settle it. So now your fast convergence story becomes a lot better. Your reliability story on a protocol becomes a lot better because you don't need to do flooding. There is no flooding. And this lets you scale beyond the point. And your configuration problem that you talked about, hey, by the way, I can solve it with templates. You can still solve it with templates on those route controllers, route reflectors, route servers, be it inline or offline, and get the best of the both worlds. Okay, but here, we are changing the algorithm. When we say algorithm, okay, Dijkstra is coming. Is Dijkstra replacing BGB best best selection decision steps? Yes. Yes. I have, I, I have a couple of slides that talk about what exact changes do we need to do. Excellent, because uh, immediate question comes to my mind. Okay, can we use BGP plus SPF on the global internet in the default free zone? But then I am coming to immediate conclusion that what about that local pref, community, all those policy attributes? So we are, if we are removing them, if we are replacing them with the Dijkstra, uh, probably it's not possible. So I want to definitely see those. Uh, okay. So that's the reason we are not running all of internet on ISIS today, right? Exactly. <laughs> policy, policy. This is, Jeff, this is where Jeff keeps us honest uh, as a routing working group chair. And of course, uh, as a good friend and... Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, I've had an opportunity to work with him. Uh, I didn't get to say this early on for a lot of years now, donkey's years. And uh, and one great quality of his is he always ensures that there is a saneness in any level of thinking. And so, uh, like Jeff said, uh, you could push some of these things, but you really want to think about this proposal, like Jeff said very early on at the onset of this conversation, is think underlay. And if you think underlay, then a lot of things become relatively simple. And we could scope it also to say, think underlay, think data centers, nail it, scale it, and then see if there is an applicability anywhere else around, and maybe talk about it, right? Love you too. <laughs> Thank you. So you saw this, and this is what we tried doing. So if you look at it, the obvious advantages are exactly what um, we talked about the peering model gets very simplified, right? Control plane flooding is optimized. We talk about this. 
route controllers or route reflectors are merely reflecting updates. If they are off the control plane path, they are not running um, even SPF. If they are inline, they run SPF and compute it. But the most important part, point is we talked about there is no head of line blocking. I don't get an update on a spine from a tor. I hold it, I run the best path, I install it, and I send it out. It's like sent out immediately, and then everybody runs in parallel. And because SPF is so fast, um, you don't have a problem. Those who, who don't right? know uh, head of line blocking, so when the basically packets wait in the uh, queue, let's say, uh, in the switch fabric. So we are, basically we are calling head of line blocking those who are interested in quality service. Maybe you, you heard already this term, just to use that. So here what we are yeah. doing, we basically uh, leave spine, everyone is just having a EBGP neighborship with the route controller. Yep. So head of line blocking here is in the context of control plane head of line blocking. And whether the leaf spine uses controller inline or off line is offline meaning it's not running on the spines but it's running on some dedicated compute is a flexibility that operator has but in either peering model you will not see head of line block right so and i think what's also important to mention is ecosystem around uh if we look at some early microsoft work actually start a lot of this uh they would have controllers peering with every switch and reverse engineer to build the graph because obviously the GP doesn't give you a graph. So you need to get from peer insertion all the prefixes and build graph as a separate process. Developing BGP lab gave us the ability to provide standard mechanism to flood link state over BGP. So all the pieces just came together at the right time for you. Yes. And that is the point Jeff made. Distributed computing. See how we translated the computing to be distributed because the controller simply reflects the routes. Now it doesn't have to run SPF to Jeff's point, but the SPF is run on that switches and whether it's a leaf spine door and the CPU made available on that switch now just does distributed computing calculation using SPF, installs the route and it's done. Yeah, yeah, here basically number of sessions are reduced. Uh, instead of maybe very densely meshed connectivity now, hub and spoke type, hub is the route controller, but uh, otherwise hub is just reflecting the route controller, reflecting the routes, then each leaf and spine, they are doing uh, SPF calculation and finding for each destination their best path. And of course, if it's ECMP, they are using multiple ways of ECMP. Exactly. So there's a question on the chat, what is a route controller, sort of ECM protocol? Complete. Who wants to? A route? Yeah. Yeah. Please go on. No, no, you, you no, please go on. You here. Yeah. The, a route controller is a very loose terminology. In this context, specifically, specifically a route controller is thought, thought of as a route server. But as Jeff mentioned early on, a route server has a very specific feature set. Here, the route controller is used in the context of simply reflecting routes like how route reflector does, but it reflects the route and doesn't install it. So route reflector typically was used like um, you said also in the context of IBGP, route controller is route reflector for EBGP. To be very simple. Yeah. And even a simplified version of route server to Jeff's point because route server has specific requirements yeah, yeah. all right yeah and so we do this we do we do this changes if this changes make sense then we wanted to do this changes on a complete separate channel in bgp you have a notion of api sati you carry ipv4 unicast you carry ipv6 unicast vpn 4 unicast we said we would carry this on a separate channel so we don't interfere with the existing BGP business, right? And how do we do that? So uh, before we go into that, here's where we talk about the flexible consumption models that we were, we were talking about earlier, right? Um, the flexible con uh, consumption models are that you could have route controller, which does both. Uh, topology and path computation. Path by path computation, I mean 
we do uh, SPF computation here. And um, um, by topology, we, we mean simply announcements. So you can have a compute that sits at the top and you could announce it, which is uh, off, this is, this is not in line, this is offline, right? It could be not on any leaf or spine, it could be on a dedicated server, it could do both the things and announce it to you in the first model. In the second model, which but is... Before you continue, what's important here, imagine your data center has more complex logic than just data. Having fast computation decoupled from the uh, onboard or on switch processing gives the ability to implement different algorithms. You want stainer tree instead of dijkstra. You want any other cost optimization. You only need to adapt your fast computation. So that that's gives the ability to think of logic that you really couldn't do before. Okay, that's correct. Also, my question for the first one. The centralized state computation. So basically for the topology information gathering, since we don't have uh, IGP here, we cannot extend the IGP. So we are using, I think, BGP link state, BGP LS. Correct? I will come, I will come to you, yes. This is, this is BGP LS like data that you gather. And the reason why we use LS here is, um, I will talk about it because the data format for this new SAPI that we have defined, the prefix, the attributes are exactly the same as the ones the, because they have a semantics of IGP link and node information that you carry. We reuse them and it becomes relatively easy to compute SPF over that data that you receive. Excellent. Okay. So, so like Jeff said, yeah, uh, the first one will do both. The second one is simply a reflector offline which is not executing SPF, uh, but just announcing routes up and down, and all these guys in the class run SPF, which is distributed, we talked about, and you get the job done. Mm -hmm. And the third model is where you don't keep this as a separate compute, but you fold it with the spine that is sitting at the layer, and simply do exactly what is supposed to be done, and everyone runs SPF and the route controller part, a route announcement part. So this fine co exists as a route controller slash route reflector, depending on what peering models we deploy. Okay, basically this slide requires lots of question now. For, for the first one, this centralized pet computation. Uh, since I have pet computation now offloaded to the route controller, there are a couple things I see. First, probably in that model, I can reduce the number of, I, I mean, uh, amount of device resources, CPU, memory, etc., on the leaf and spine, I think. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, another one, actually, for the pet computation part on the route controller, can I, maybe with this approach, right, not only CSPF, constraint-based SPF, other type of, uh, algorithms might be possible, right? That is correct. Okay, so basically trade-offs are uh, distributed versus centralized architecture and another one also hybrid. So all these uh, different deployment models basically possible here, you already defined. That's so correct. in the second, second model, we are not calculating. Actually, we are saying, okay, if you don't want to calculate on the route controller the path, so each and individual devices, like what you do today, distributed routing, it's possible. And also we are saying that uh, even for the topology gathering, we can use not maybe separate device, but we can off, we can use this functionality on the spine devices. Okay, why spine was chosen for that one? Because more information that we are keeping there? Because typically spine can aggregate information. So in some sense, you can think about leaves simply pointing a default to spine. Spine gets all the leaf routes and then spine runs the SPF and says, well, I'm gonna tell you where the connectivity are. Or even if this store has a default, just one route pointing towards the spine, right? And he wants to send a data to a tor which is on a far left side, the default will get into the spine, but spine needs to compute and do some, if it's a multi-tier network, to say where where exactly does he need to forward, and it has enough data so it can run SPF. 
Uh, depending on the data, the SPF could be complicated or simplified, and it will simply install the more specifics up there and do the job as it's needed. Yeah. By the way, for the first one, centralized pet computation, do we need to have some, uh, like, if it's running underlay network, segment routing based network, uh, do we need to have any SR extension, etc.? Segment routing extension. So, the beauty of it is because we use BGP LS based encoding, if you look at BGP EPE, egress peer engineering, it is designed on top of LS. And therefore, those packet formats just come in handy as you start to progress it towards this SAFI because it's already inbuilt. So many Again, things. The idea was to leverage, right? Existing things, yeah. Leveraging existing things yeah. uh, in a smart way yeah. the, to fulfill the requirements. So because immediately comes to my mind, like uh, what was the requirement? Okay, stability, conversion speed. Conversion speed was important. BGP couldn't solve this issue. So we needed uh, IGP for that. Okay, one question. Topology information gathering. Why did that part is necessary? I mean, topology information with the link state protocols are possible, fine. But in this MSDCs, massive scale data centers, why topology information is necessary here? Because you want to go from Tor 1, 5-10 years back, the data traffic within MSDCs was north-south, which means the TORs were only servicing a traffic out of the data center. Now that traffic is becoming a lot more east-west, which means you see this uh, leaf on the left side, chances of him sending the data to a leaf on a right side is very much higher now than it was 10 years back. So not only do you need north-south traffic, but you need east-west traffic. Now, what we did was, and this is important, so I'm going to take a minute sure. and talk about it. But this leaf on the left side that connects to the spine, I hope you see my arrow, Yes. Um, was a hop one hop session. If this leaf wanted to send a data through this spine, this spine, this spine, or this spine to this particular leaf, it would send the data up here. And then something here has to send the data here for the server that was sitting here. Yeah. So the reachability of this address was av made available to here and possibly here if this was not being routed using defaults. Case in point, if the workloads move, you need more specifics here. So for that, the way eBGP solved it is a reachability that was here was announced by a Tor to this guy. Mm -hmm. He would install the route pointing this way, and then he would announce it to all these guys, and they would all point it up here, or it would be default. That was a hop by hop peering. If I change a peering here, let's say if I had a server here, let's say in this middle model or in the first model where the topology, where the route controller is sitting here, all these guys would peer to just this guy. They would not have an hop by hop peering. They would have a peering here. They would have a peering here. Now, when this guy reflects it to this guy saying a server reachability that is behind here is reachable via this leaf 42, this guy needs to solve the reachability to leaf 42. He has no underlay route to, re to reach the leaf 42. The Dijkstra gets him to say to reach leaf 42 you can go through spine one, spine two, spine three, spine four. You can pick that spine. Because it's not hop by hop peering now, the Dijkstra helps it solve. Just like how the Dijkstra helps BGP loopback addresses in WAN solve over ISIS route. There is no ISIS here, and that is why we came up with the notion of LSVR. Okay, then if this is the case, for the third model, inline route controller model, I don't need to have uh, Dijkstra. You still may need to have a Dijkstra depending on how deep this clause is. So let's say, let's say this clause is multi-layer deep. Exactly. I, I got your point. If 
more than one hope away, so you still, yeah, need that visibility. Okay. And we are simply giving flexibility to our operators to say, you can turn on the Dijkstra, you can turn off the Dijkstra. You can actually turn off the Dijkstra everywhere here by just saying default pointed to leave, uh, to spine. No Dijkstra. Okay. What about all my good local pref, ESPET origin net, hot potato routing? What happened to those things? So, a standard, so one big advantage of this approach is now you use SPF and link matrix. We did, do not disable any policy-based functionality also, but they become somewhat irrelevant if you are using plain old vanilla SPF, which uses IGP matrix. You want to use local prep, you want to use some kind of MED, you want to harmonize them using AIGP, use a flavor of CSPF. <laughs> okay, but is it possible for, for me, for example, to disable uh, Dijkstra and run classical BGP? Yes, because it's a different SAFI, you just turn off this SAFI and run IPv4 Unicast and that kicks in. Okay. So right. in order for any link state protocol to work, you need to ensure that LSDB across everybody participating is the same. So that's fundamental right. difference, right? Yeah. So see, the benefits are huge. Now you go up to the operator and say, you have operationalized BGP, your ops tool, your monitoring tool, understand BGP, they can do packet, packet decode on IP yes, IP for multicast, IPv6, so forth, so on. So on. Well, this is just a new SAFI. Yeah. And oh, by the way, the packet formats are same as LS. If you have onboarded LS, you have to make zero change. It will, the entire decoding system, the onboarding system will understand what you're doing yet you get the many benefits. This is what we were squarely focused on. That is why we did LSPR. So by the so way, I- So my history to that, uh, about six, seven years ago, uh, in routing working group, which I chair, we kind of came together. So Kiyur, people from, the better from Facebook, uh, people from a uh, uh, bunch of vendors. And so we need to do something about routing to data center. BGP is there. It has a number of really significant uh, drawbacks. Good point. Why to, so they're both constant problems. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we also need to think about larger topologies and different use cases. So we run a bunch of meetings and actually created a draft that would specify all the requirements for next generation routing protocol for data center. And as end result, uh, we crystallized two solutions. One of them is Reef which is fully distributed, could be centralized as well, and LSVR. So they run in parallel, both provide different solutions and allow and customer to choose based on their requirements, what is it they would like to do. But this is kind of how idea of process really works when done properly, right? Yeah. You get solutions that are focused on solving customer problem and built on top of existing technologies that we, that are well understood. By the way, these are both Rift and uh, LSVR, these are not experimental or informational, right? These are standard. Yeah. Right? No. No. So uh, LSVR has implementation on uh, Arcus. Rift has implementation on Juniper, and there are a bunch of open source implementations as well. Okay. Yeah, I am in process of just submitting implementation spec. Our spec is a little more straightforward. But I think, Jack, now we also have uh, folks from Arista and uh, VMware contributing in to a Zebra. So we have an implementation for Zebra. Um, and I think we have two implementations there as of now. And uh, I think uh, it's moving towards reasonably OK. It's, it's somewhat of a control problem because it's just a new SAP feature. But so this because to yeah. give you an example, I, I have probably three or four new routing protocols and routing that are somewhat progressing but don't get any market attention. Um, I mean, I'm not saying they're bad, but they're less interesting. What's yeah. really important is market. Yes. Looking at protocols saying, hey, it solves my real problem, let me try it. And yeah. it's true for both Rift and LSVR. But uh, what so, I've seen. Work well done, listening to the customer, understanding the technologies the limitation and what should be done to enable this new functionality. But when we, what we see is 
of course, we all know now uh, Rift very well. For Rift, what I could say is there is a learning curve for the Rift, for example. First thing is this one. Another thing, maybe uh, even hardware upgrade. Uh, another thing is totally operationally different uh, model for me and for many network engineers, I, I should say. But this one, our good old friend BGP and basically SPF coming together. Uh, so lots of architecture we know, like seamless MPLS, unified MPLS. If you don't know anything about MPLS, it's complex. But if you know MPLS, really, it is just building blocks. This one is just building block for me immediately in probably uh, almost everyone who watched this video, they 100% probably will understand what we have been talking. Sometimes we use some terminologies and we try to even uh, clarify those things, right? So, uh, but other than that, everything is much, much simpler. Uh, I mean, Rift, sure, nice protocol solving a lot of uh, use a lot of problems even mentioned in the RFC 7938, those shortcuts, etc., how the Rift is handling those. But the uh, problem is, yeah, it's learning curve in the first place. Uh, and this one just building block, really. And everything about BGP, we know we are investing about whatever we have invested. We keep basically those knowledge and start using this. So troubleshooting will be much easier, uh, so on and so forth, in my opinion. So having kind of routing working group chair head on, both protocols solve somewhat different problem, and I think ITF made a good decision to fund both to see yeah. how they progress, and eventually, you know, the market to decide what to use. And Kyur, do you think Kyur, do you think to uh, implement Rift in Arcus? Any pro any plan? We we are very focused on um, being a small company. We have uh, a startup. We obviously focus on what our customer needs are, yeah. and uh, what and we do features and technology. Really, when a customer comes with some problem, so I will tell you where why we implemented uh, LSVR also in that way. Um, I think I have one slide at the end. If okay. not, I will speak to it. Okay. But. From our perspective, if we see a customer who comes and puts us a big fat paycheck in front of us, hey, we will implement it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, sure. And depending on vendor, you, I mean, we see more and more between seeing who is doing what. So we know there is a, a flood reduction work for common GP. So mostly I say. Yeah. So probably if you talk to a retail, they'll tell you I said the best protocol. You talk to Cisco. They'll tell you whatever you like. So Juniper, <laughs> since we have done there, might tell you uh, Rift is the best thing for you. But if you want BGP, you have it too. So it's really it's good to have a choice. But being a clever network engineer, you really need to understand the difference in technologies and what technology works best for you. And that's actually why we are doing. It. We are trying to educate and share so you have better data to make well-informed decisions. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then you say, well, what does the actual solution um, um, entails, right? And and what it entails is the following. It's a new Saki, exactly same semantics as LS, LS um, Saki is, except for it's a newer one that carries the same encoding mechanisms and same attributes, right? So the capability is different. Of course, we supply support multiple pairing models, as you said. And as part of this capability, new SAP, you enable this, suddenly Dijkstra is executed as part of Despa. Yeah. Now, when we execute Dijkstra, what we do is we still carry next swap attribute with the routes in the update message, like LS SAP carries. But what we do is the decision process phase one and phase two now is replaced by SPF algorithm. The next stop becomes pretty much useless for us. The SPF now executes and detects what the real next stop is. The third phase, which is in BGP, you run a phase one, phase two, figure out what's the best part, and then announce the route out. That first phase is short-circuited because we simply take the update that was received, announce it to rest of the guys, and run SPF in parallel. 
simple. We always because not to forget about multi-threading. Now it have a cool, cool and very, very straightforward model to multi-thread all the processes. Absolutely. Which leads to very significant improvement in performance. Absolutely. Now, uh, we always carry updated route information in BGP. We never carry old data. So we don't have a problem like IGPs have that you need to carry the version numbers and stuff like that to figure out because we aren't looping LS, LS, LSPs or LSAs um, and you don't need to break the loop or stuff like that. However, just to be absolutely sure of the P because the, dice, because the clause is multiple peers up and multiple peers down, we have a notion of se se sequence numbers that always guarantees that the latest version is received by you. And but therefore, you always accept the latest version of that. Is this sequence number for the BGP update, I think, is it used, is it used for any mobility also? No, right? No. No, in no. EVPN, I think we are using because uh, that's why. Okay. Yeah, but it's uh, it's different. You just advertise particular value with the uh, route, the type to route specific. Yeah, but right? the, also so the sequ time, sequence number for so mobility was used there. You compare it. Yeah. Yeah. What's important? There's a comparison between routes you have received previously and the one on when you compare the value in the standard community. So you know which one is newer. You know when to stop accepting it. So this is very different. Yeah, like Jeff said, it is for a different use. Conceptually, they give you the same thing is that the most recent uh, sequence number is the one that you accept. In EVPN, it is with extended community, like Jeff said, and here it's at the entire update. This one is very similar to uh, what in OSPF ISAS we have, this sequence right. number concept. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We start with a very simplified SPF, scales very well um, in our reports and performance numbers we get, we got, we actually scaled this better than, in fact, uh, uh, one of the IGPs. Um, also, it's very fast because you don't do periodic refreshes with the database updates and stuff like that. TCP was exceedingly fast, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and so we, ha we had some performance numbers that we compared against uh, traditional OSPF and ISIS uh, against this solution and this came out to be a much better um, and it actually scales really well as your fan out increases which means Jeff, uh, if you do 8 way CMP versus 32 versus 64 versus 128 um, the performance um, uh, for this the scale numbers turn out to be much better so that was a good sign at least that we were on the right path. One um, question uh, you said from the scalability point of view here uh, we are using Okay, BGP and still underlays, I mean, uh, communication will be on top of TCP. So uh, okay. normally with IGP, of course, maybe it's wrong to give numerical number, but 5,000, 10,000, not hundreds of thousands of prefixes. We cannot carry with the IGP, it cannot scale, we know that. So uh, here, Dijkstra is used for the head computation and... Is somehow Dijkstra putting any limit for the number of prefix or just because it's on top of TCP, uh, I can still carry even millions of prefixes? What do you say? Yes. No, so the, the limitations in IGPs are not because of Dijkstra, but because of format of LSA and LSP. For example, I said in ISO protocol that has particular limits, right? They are well described in ISO docu documentation. So. If your implementation is good enough, you could run Dijkstra on millions of millions of routes. It's really the encoding of the routing information that limits you in the amount of routes that you could advertise in single level already. Interesting, but you said for the ISAS, what about OSPF? It's the same thing. Yeah, same okay. thing. It's really the format and number of bits in the header used to advertise, right? Okay. We have no restrictions here. So we can scale fairly well in terms of Dijkstra, as Jeff pointed out. Um, typically, you don't have that bad of a restriction because you run Dijkstra, although if you have a router with, let's say, 10,000 ports, you just run Dijkstra once for that router. You, uh, Meaning, you run Dijkstra on the router ID of that router, not on each one of those 10,000 prefixes. So Dijkstra is less of a problem compared to the prefix, or compared to the packet length that Jeff was talking about. 
Okay. So I look at my previous experience, <clears throat> five, six years ago, being with vendors, uh, you could run SPF on a topology with 1,000 knots and 10,000 rounds <clears throat> below one millisecond. Then question is, okay, why we have, I mean, okay, still uh, it comes to policy and when we say policy, everything is finished. So we cannot even find a question. BGP is policy, not only just, uh, you know, routing protocol, but very importantly, especially for the global internet. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think, I think the main uh, constraint in data center was the flooding. And there wasn't any good handle to optimize flooding because one thing that IGPs in particular don't do well is to nip the flooding. And that part of the problem is already solved by BGP because it's point-to-point TCP-based and, and, and so forth and so on. So we wanted to actually build on top of that. And that is why now that you get the benefits of Dijkstra, Couple that with the flooding optimizations you are in the place, you have a ideal choice at least for the class based architectures. As they scale out, you have an ideal choice of protocol that meets the scale as well as the convergence requirements. So, and to show you how kind of ITF evolves in terms of flooding in uh, class topology, so uh, IGP flood reduction decouple flooding topology from physical topology. So right. now you can choose a flooding linear and build topology that's much smaller than number of it. So this is done for SS and SPF. Yeah. In the RIP, you know, you do link state up, but down you don't need to flood. It's only your own route plus summary plus B. So, so you reduce the yeah. number of flood routes significantly. Here you use die yeah, so you see, everybody understands their problem with flooding. There are different ways to solve it, and this is how LSVR is solved. So basically, with the Rift southbound distance vector and northbound, you are running link states, so uh, less information you are sending to the lower uh, layer. Here, what we are doing, not like a link state up, down, uh, distance vector, etc. Basically, we have distance vector, BGP is still there. Uh, we are using distance vector part for the uh, reachability information and then for the topology information calculation, so the PET calculation, we are using link state, the extra. That's the idea. And when we did, I will tell you this, that when we did start effort seven years back, back then I was at Cisco, we did analysis um, of doing something like this in BGP and we compared it with, I want to say, OSPF very carefully. And notice the amount of code change and the question that you asked in the beginning, the amount of complexity um, that is there with regards to code change. If you take that software engineering expense in mind, the changes that we are doing here are relatively straightforward because we, it's well understood how to create a new RPC RP. It's actually well understood if you have implemented LS, how to decode and encode those office RPs. Now the complex, complexity is only in executing SPF, but you have SPF code in OSPF that, that, that you know how SPFs are executed. So if you do this well, it's a matter of software engineering and you don't have to worry about remaining parts because the protocol stays intact. I just wanted to give you a background about that as to why we picked BGP also, because the code changes were um, somewhat straightforward, if you will, right? Now, coming back to this slide, um, it supports dual stack, V4 and V6. If it supports V4, then the obvious question you would ask is, well, how does it work with IPv4 unicast? And Whose routes would you pick if you have dual SAFI turned on? This and IPv4 unicast inside BGP. Well, it's a matter of local implementation policy. You have to pick one. And what the proposal says is that if both the native SAFI, V4, IPv4 unicast or IPv6 unicast versus SPF is enabled, we tend to give a preference to SPF and select their routes as a tiebreaker routes to be installed in ribbon fit. That is what the proposal says, yeah?
Um, how do you originate routes? Well, so now you can think of conceptually a door. Think of all the interfaces that door has. Mm -hmm. You can originate those routes by redistribution. Mm -hmm. Redistribute connected straight into BGP, LS format, send it out to the spine. The spine may choose to send you a default because you've just configured neighbor, blah, 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 default originate, and it'll only send neighbor, or it'll tell send you the spine's route. If the route controller or route reflector or route server is not co-located in spine, your pairing would be with that server on which it resides, and that guy will simply reflect it to the rest of the guys in the clause, and off you start computing the extra. Still, uh, leaf will send wire redistribution, controller will receive, reflect to another leaf, and that's it, okay. Right, and the forwarding bi-directional link detection is done using BFD. There are other techniques um, like LNTP or L3DL that has been discussed, wherein you recognize, figure out the links, you bring them up, and you start going installing the routes. L3DL, interesting. Right. The interesting part here, it's not only LSCI. If you look both Cisco and Juniper, for example, both give you service layer API, so Jet and Juniper case, service layer API in, in, in LSCI start case, you could take BGP feed and run your decision process absolutely separately of both. So right. it's definitely in the direction, especially for larger people. Got you it. try to run BGP best path or route best path selection in a way that gives the logic state rather than the traditional way. Correct. So that is what we talk about here with regards to route origination. From convergence level, we have made certain improvements. You know how BGP update goes and it can be big. It doesn't have a limit. So when a link down event or a prefix down event happens, technically, there could be some head of line blocking because you have more routing data. And you actually want this link down event to go as fast as possible. So what we end up doing is we actually end up creating a separate attribute that you can send it fast out of... Uh, order in sense that you can send this little information upfront as fast as possible to say, hey, the following link on the door one has gone down, everybody reconverts to that, and you have a solution. Same for link and a prefix down. Oh, it we is, break it into two steps. It's almost similar to uh, make mess with troll, something like that, right? Yes, correct. Thank you. you, you you've been drinking BGP Kool-Aid for a long, long time, I can see. <laughs> that is perfect. <laughs> that is perfect. It's a mass withdrawal. Um, um, and that gets you what you want. So you two-step the process, like you say, right? Send a mass withdrawal, and you actually don't withdraw it, but it's in this context just marks that the link has gone down, and then an actual withdrawal will follow, which will let you settle. So it's a fast convergence story. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where do we use this? Why Arcus? And you see, one of the things we have done is we have come up with a BGP EVPN fabric. Jeff made that cryptic comment, which was a million dollar comment at the beginning, where he said that in context of EVPN, you don't need hop by hop here. You can have a VXLAN overlay connected from, from this leaf to this leaf, or this leaf, which has the same uh, set of uh, VNIs, or bridge domains connected to this link, right? It could be an overlay connection. But if you do an overlay connection, which is very, very simple, you need an underlay. And that would typically be hop by hop IPv4 unicast BGP or IPv6 unicast BGP. Well, that can be LSVR now. And it's a full stack solution, single protocol, less configuration, support scale out, goes on top of EVPN, which is also a very scale sensitive, convergence sensitive application, Question. and it just nips. Question is coming now. So for underlay, we have that route controller. Maybe we can uh, use that route controller for the EVPN route reflector functionality as well. Bingo. <laughs> now you have a single point that does full policy computation, and you can do end-to-end -end traffic engineering 
Now you're thinking like a big, massive scale data center uh, architect who's saying, I want a central point or I want a couple of central points for deep visibility and traffic entry data. Yeah. Uh, interesting point here, EVPN is AVPN technology. So underlying assumption, everybody gets all the routes and then by using RTE import, you'll import what you're interested in. If you have centralized point of control, now you can do RT constraints, which is very yes. powerful technology to limit amount of routes, right? Yeah, it, it will yeah. provide scalability RT constraint he's talking about for route target for the service layer, by yeah. the way. Those uh, yeah. who don't know, Basically, later on, uh, when you check RT constraint, you can have a look for the scalability solution. Okay. So I think this is my last slide. Um, it's it's a very powerful technology. There is another technology that we are developing in LSVR working group. I just want to take a second and say, please. just as how you have BFD, and Jeff, please keep me honest, just as how you have BFD that does a link level liveness, we wanted to come up with a reliable last mile discovery protocol that could be used inside a fabric too. But think today, between TORS and the servers, it's pretty much an L2 connectivity. The downside of that is when you move workloads from one server to another, it is the forwarding that learns that the MAC address has moved and that is why you have that EVPN extended community where you start to bump and say, hey, this route is reachable through now leaf 44 instead of leaf, leaf 1, and I have bumped the community community counter so that you know this is the latest route, right? Mm -hmm. Or what if there was a TCP-like reliable discovery protocol that would reside on a server that tells you that the workload above me has disappeared, so I'm going to withdraw the route? Just a second. Ser server is running with the, let's say, leaf, and, okay, can you repeat that part again? What if there was a reliable channel between a server and the leaf that could go and say, this are all the MAC addresses sitting on top, and, oh, by the way, the MAC address 44 has disappeared because the workload has moved. So leaf will say that. The, the, the server will tell the leaf, so EVPN will automatically withdraw it. You don't learn it in the forwarding. It's a discovery protocol that tells you. Interesting. But if it disappears today, you'll have actually to time out, right? It takes hours, yeah. which is not very important because you're not any traffic, but in general, it's... So if you look at solutions like the Amber, they do it through their own control plane because they're a signaling channel, obviously between hypervisor and centralized controller. In routing, we don't have this machinery. You rely on either uh, re-advertising of new routes somewhere else. That's where we are going to use the sense community, or you just time out. What Kiyor is saying, imagine server has a way to actually tell you. Yeah, but uh, even server tells me, I got the point. S server tells me, still, uh, I will continue to use those extending community type 2 routes, etc. So from the new moved place, I will, I will learn from that new new place. So uh, combining yeah. it with the L3DL, right. what, why combining? So, so one example is you will learn from the new place. How fast will you learn? Mm. How fast will you age this out? If it was a deterministic way that I could tell you age out now and update now, which is through that. TCP channel, reliable channel-like protocol that tells you from a server, aside from everything else, what is, in fact, if you programmatically configure a label on the server, you say IP address to label binding from server to the door. This is what it is. Discovery-related information. Okay. Network discovery-related information. If you do just hop by hop, that would be massive because now the doors don't have to do any L2 learning. Okay. It's, you see my point? I, I got, I think. Uh, so you are saying from the old location, it will send that uh, age out. And from the new location, will it also say from the new location, I am here now? Announce, yes. Announce. That's one example. Okay. But uh, then today, without EVPN, etc., traditionally we are doing in the data plane, this one, data plane learning way in this region, what we are doing, make address 
age out time, five minutes, etc. We need to wait from this side. And from the another side, we are expecting gracious ARP, GARP messages to come and announce, right? All gone. Yes. It's all deterministic, no layer to learning. You you tell forwarding, your job is to forward the packets. Mm -hmm. Do not tell control plane how to learn these things. Control plane should learn it out of band. If you do that deterministically, is one one could argue that if you learn things in forwarding, they're not as deterministic. Um, maybe they are, maybe they're not, depending on the technology that you use. And and so if and so if you step back and say, well, then what's the problem? The problem is that we have a mechanism to detect the link level liveness. It's called BFD. We do not have mechanism that tells you uh, rich information like how CDP says that, hey, I'm going to tell you every network level information between these links, and therefore you should know what that is. Um, it could be a BGP peering information. What? It could be workload information. It could be MAC to IP binding. It could be MAC IP and label binding. It could be anything. If you're using Geneva at last mile or GRE at last mile on the servers, if you could just tell that to all. But some of them can be done with the LLDP. Exactly. I'm yeah. about that. Yes. Yes. So, so hold on to that part. So, if you could do in a holistic manner, then that would be phenomenal because you got an end-to-end -end story. Then you look at it and go like, what the options are out there? You have LLDP, but uh, and and you have CDP. Of course, CDP is far more richer, but it's a Cisco discovery yeah. protocol. LLDP is there, but there are several constraints in LLDP. LLDP has um, a way to announce, but it's like IGPs. It does a periodic refresh. It has a max packet length. You can't include send packet beyond certain size. So if you really want to come up with a generic protocol that just discovery, you need to have um, reliable delivery that when I tell you withdraw, it should reach you and you should withdraw. When I tell you announce, for example, in EVPN case, it should reach you, it should announce. It shouldn't say, oh, my packet size has gone beyond, so I can't send you the announcement, but I can send you a withdrawal from that side. Now you have a black hole, in, right? Yeah. You need a deterministic way. And so when we looked at some of those things, we said, ah, mm, maybe um, it would be nice if there is a good discovery way to bring it out. It's a holistic way. We tend to think LLDP at layer two. We want to do this more for layer three and above. So there is an effort that's going on. And uh, one of the things we have written an open source implementation of L3DL, which we want to give it out to folks for free that they can start deploying out on the server, particularly for EVPNs, to make the last mile absolutely dumb and simple. Okay. So that you can move the workloads. To provide you also some perspective here. A uh, number of ITFs ago, we have common meetings with uh, IT police, which is in charge of LLDP. Uh, they're working on LLDP v2 spec that would potentially allow similar functionality, but we are trying to be fast and market needs something, right? So rather than waiting for LLDP version two, which is going to be more extendable and to meet demand better, this is a solution that could provide similar functionality without relying on LLDP. And actually there is draft by TUR that defines how to redistribute LLDP data into BGP. Okay, but uh, the question is, uh, normally LSVR, so far BGP SPF, it's an underlay solution which we are trying to solve the fabric issue, not the service issue it seems. But uh, to me, this detection, reliable way of uh, detecting this with the L3DL, it seems like service layer issue. Why both of this, I mean BGP plus SPF as well as L3DL uh, is solved in LSVR? Very correct comment. When we started with this effort, we wanted two problems to be solved. We wanted the fabric to be solved, which is Tor leaves fine. How do you do fast convergence? How do you announce the reachability? How do you go solve about it? The second issue we wanted to solve was how do we automate uh, layer three discovery information? Could okay. be configuration 
could be routing, could be anything else. And that should actually cover servers also, not just all these points. So when we looked at it, we, like Jeff said, we have two solutions. Uh, if you look at it out there, which carries uh, BGP configuration information, we wanted to automate BGP configs. So want to carry automate BGP configs, you can do it in LLDP, you can do it in this protocol. Um, okay. We wanted to start with this for all the reasons that Jeff talked about, which was fast time to delivery. We actually have an open source implementation. Go on and build upon it, right? If it works well between server and Tor, and Tor and Leaf, you could use it for other discovery purposes. So that is where the effort started. And if you look at both these efforts and you combine to them, you have a holistic solution that actually covers end-to-end -end data centers, right? And kind of oh. talking for ITF again, uh, both LSCR and Reef are being written as well as developed at the same time. So it's not some theoretical exercise compared to you know, Etsy, where you write stuff and then you have it to work. It's really tested as being written, right? So you know that what you're putting in a draft is exactly what worked, what worked for your customer. You really know what you're doing and you know, makes you really happy as a routing person. Okay. By the, the way, quality of the draft. If, uh, by the way, I think you said this was the last slide, right? So my yes. question here uh, for the Arcus actually will be because BGP SPF very clear and the reason the requirement of L3DL is also clear for me and why both protocol was in the same working group was also clear. Uh, for Arcus, if we want to, let's say, try it on any open uh, hardware, can we do it or what's the procedure? Yes, so uh, Arcus, of course, is not an open source uh, uh, operating system, as you know. Mm -hmm. We are a closed source operating system. Think of us like, uh, from that perspective, like Cisco, Arista, Juniper, um, or Nokia for that matter. Uh, we do give eval software out for uh, validation. We have set of platforms that we have validated on the switching side, we provide um, uh, switches from one gig ethernet all the way to 400 gig ethernet. On routing side, we provide switches uh, or routers from 10, 25, 40, 50, 100, and 400 gigs. Fixed form factor up to 80 ports, 400 gigs. So depending on what um, solution you want, we can give you a software on top of it, or we can give you just a VM software that you can play around and start looking at this as from a solution standpoint, no problem. But you are not targeting... And besides outstanding capabilities of Kiyur, he probably is humble to talk about. His team, most people have known for many, many years, works younger, absolutely outstanding, one of the best routing engineers in the industry. So I can just imagine the quality of routing. After me. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, but uh, you are not only targeting, Arcus is not only targeting the massively scaled data centers, right? No, definitely no. not. So we are in the switching and routing. Yes, Jeff, you're saying something, sorry. Jeff, were you saying something? Uh, no, not anymore. No, I think he okay. finished. I, I, maybe I heard wrong. Yes, we provide uh, solutions on both routing and um, switching. From a fabric standpoint, we support IPv4, IPv6, Unicast, um, label unicast v4 and v6 segment routing um, mpls and srv6 wow srv6 especially yeah. these uh, days i am hearing more and more <laughs> yeah and ebp and vxlan so uh, obviously for for the for the data centers so we cover holistically routing and switching portfolios and uh, these days so many people even i can say not massively skilled data centers definitely medium or maybe even small scale data centers they are uh, they are deploying they deployed i know many people uh, even some people basically we also recorded uh, videos you can see on, on the youtube channel uh, they are deploying evpn vxlan and all these things so they can consider uh, using arcus as well definitely have a look these are tools available tools have a look uh, if it solves your issue, then go to the cost model, talk with them, 
So uh, these guys are really, as Jeff said, uh, very well known. Uh, most of the things, most of the devices today you use, uh, coded by Kior and his team. So uh, have a look at those. Okay, guys, what uh, else you would say before we close? One, one last comment from my side, Please. Jeff, Oran, thank you so much for the opportunity you gave us. Thank you. It was great. Thank you for coming yeah. over and uh, educating us and other people what you've been doing. And we will continue doing this for other solutions. So we'll try to keep everybody honest and, you know, no ads. Yeah, definitely. It was great to have uh, Kiyos. Uh, Jeff uh, usually uh, anyway joins and introduces great people. So we will continue. Have a look at the Arcus website also, guys. And uh, probably I will share post on the BGP plus SPF and LSVR working group. Especially this uh, L3DL is new for me. I will uh, check and I will let you know more information about that one as well. So thanks, guys, for joining. Bye for now. Take care, everyone. And talk to you very soon. Be safe. Thank you. Be safe.